escuchando a mí en el día de hoy. Um, voy a presentar en inglés, pero si alguien no entiende algo durante mi presentación, yo puedo repetir, repetir o explicar en el fin de presentación en español. Um, so thanks for coming once again. Uh, I've titled my presentation today, Helicopter Pazia in Puerto Rico, Hybridization and Resistance. Um, I am a member of the Center for Excellence in Quarantine and Invasive Species located in the Estacion Agricola in Rio Piedras um, at UPR Mayagüez, as all of you know. Um, today for my presentation, just to give you guys an outline, I'm going to talk, uh, Sequis is broken down into two main groups. The first group is Helicoverpo, which I'm a member of, and the second half of Sequis um, conducts studies with coffee berry borers and parasitoids of coffee berry borers. Uh, today I'll be talking about our Helicoverpo group and what kinds of studies we do at Sequis with Helicoverpo and other noctuid moths. So my primary project is studying the hybridization of Helicoverpozea and Helicoverpo armigera here in Puerto Rico. Um, additional projects that I also conduct at Sequis with Noctuids and Helicoverpa is population monitoring, insecticide resistance, um, metabolism effects, uh, metabolism and the effects of insecticides, parasitism, and climate change on metabolism in insects like Helicoverpa. So first to introduce our species of interest today, the first of which is Helicoverpozea. In English, the common name for Helicoverpozea is the New World bullworm, or simply just the bullworm. Um, this species of Lepidoptera is native to both North and South America and Central America and the Caribbean. It is a very common pest of corn, soybeans, tomatoes, and peppers, um, and cotton as well. Um, Helicoverpozea has an estimated range of over two, about 200 different host plants. Unfortunately, in this species, there is very widespread resistance to both chemical and GMO insecticides, such as BT-based insecticides, um, which I'll get into a little bit later in the presentation. And annually, around the globe, there is an estimated around of about $1 billion in damage to agriculture caused by Helicoverpozea. And here on the right, I have a photo of some maize I collected in Juana Diaz, which is totally covered in Helicoverpozea larva, as you can see. Our second species of interest today is Helicoverpa armigera, which is the invasive species of concern, um, which we are studying in the Center for Insectes. So Helicoverpa armigera has the common name of the Old World bullworm, and this species is native to Europe, Africa, and Asia. So unfortunately, this species has become invasive, invasive in the New World and was first detected in Brazil in 2013. Since that time in Puerto Rico, it was detected in 2014. Um, so there, there is a lot of concern that this species will become invasive, get a foothold and spread throughout the Americas and the Caribbean as well. So Helicoverpa armigera overall is more damaging than Helicoverpa zia. It has a higher range of host plants an estimated about uh, 172 different host plants. Um, can the Helicoverpa armigera can feed on over 172 different plants. It is also has more voracious feeding behavior in that it also just generally eats more plant material uh, than Helicoverpa zia. It has also have different levels of insecticide resistance depending on what class of insecticide you're looking at. So in comparison to Helicoverpa zia, Helicoverpa armigera may be more resistant to Bt insecticides or organophosphates, garbamates, these kinds of things. So, like I said, our measure was first detected in Brazil in 2013, uh, where it has since this time become a major pest in soybeans, corn, and other agricultural products that come out of Brazil. It's not really known where the Helicoverpa armigera came from when it entered into Brazil. It could have been from Africa, could have been from Asia, could have been from Europe. No one really knows at this time, to my knowledge. Uh, and Helicoverpa armigera in Puerto Rico. So like I mentioned, it causes more damage annually than Helicoverpa zia around the globe. Um, it has different resistance levels in both chemical and GMO insecticides, has a higher range of pl host plants and more voracious feeding behavior. Um, and annually it's estimated that armigera is responsible for over $2 billion of damage annually in agriculture. So. USDA and other um, government organizations are really worried that our measure 
will get a foothold in the Americas and the Caribbean and become a new mega pest in these areas. And this map here is an, uh, a prediction map produced here at Sekis. Um, so this is an, a prediction of how our measure might spread in Puerto Rico. So here in the map, you can see that in the south and the southwest regions, um, our measure would have more of a football foothold since uh, in these regions, the climate and the host plants are more favorable for our measure in these areas of the island. So hybridization, which is our main focus of the projects that I am involved here at Sekis. So unfortunately, these two species have the capacity to, um, to mate and produce viable hybrid offspring um, diverged from Helicoverpa armigera in an estimated 1.5 million years ago. Um, it is likely that armigera migrated across the Bering Strait in what is now Alaska and then spread south towards the rest of North America, Central America, and South America. So uh, the main issue here with the, these two species hybridizing is that first, they are cryptic and very difficult to differentiate between. Um, they have very similar morphology to their um, parent species, and molecularly, they're also very difficult to differentiate. Um, there's also a lot of concern that hybrids will have a transfer of important genetic alleles, such as those that contribute to insecticide resistance. So how I mentioned that Armigera can have different or greater levels of resistance, it's a concern that these hybrid offspring will have these same resistance traits that Armigera has, and therefore we're having more resistant offspring spreading throughout the Americas and Caribbean. Um, it's also a concern that the hybrids will inherit the feeding behavior of our measure as well and have a wider range of host plants and eat more plant material than um, a pure Helicoverpazia would. So you can see here. Oh, okay, so I want to break down into steps how we approach this problem of Helicoverpa hybridization. So I've broken it down into three main steps. The first step of which was we need to create and gather a diverse sample library of Zia, Armigera, and then Zia Armigera hybrids for experimental purposes. The second step is after we've gathered this library is we need to improve and add whole genome sequencing data for each of these species being Zia, Armigera, and hybrids. Um, in general, beyond just this problem of species hybridization, these two mega pest lineages do need to have increased sequencing diversity made public. So for example, um, my PhD thesis was on um, genomics of insecticide resistance in Zia. And um, at the time when we did this work in 2016, there was no sequencing data available for Zia. So we had to align our genome to our measure at this time. Since that time, Zia has been produced, but one of the goals of our project is to simply make more available and public um, good quality sequencing data for Zia, Armigera, and hybrids. So after we have produced all these genomes for Zia, Armigera, and hybrids, um, we want to use portions of the genome unique to hybrids to develop a rapid identif identification test that is suitable for identifying hybrids that anyone can use in a lab uh, without a bunch of training or a bunch of experience. Um, yeah. All right. So the first step we needed to do is we need to produce some F1 and F2 hybrids of Zia and our measure of for experimental purposes. And this was the work of a past member of Sekis, Dario Trujillo, um, who has since moved on. So first, what we did is we used Helicoverpa armigera males, which were collected from Brazil and then Helicoverpa zia females collected from here in Puerto Rico in Juan Adias. Um, so the Dario conducted a bunch of breeding experiments in order to produce these F1 and F2 hybrids for experimental purposes. So what, we, what he found was that in the lab setting, it is quite difficult to produce F1 and F2 hybrids. When we use the mating pairing of Armigera males and zia females, the eggs were only 11% viable when he mated Armigera females and Zia males, um, the eggs produced were even less viable than this. We don't really know how different the viability of F1 and F2 hybrid offspring might be in the field setting, um, since that would be extremely difficult to um, conduct an experiment on that. So I want to give you guys a little bit of background about how we 
tried to identify hybrids using traditional methodology. So traditionally, when people want to differentiate a Helicoverpa armigera from a Helicoverpa zea, there are two main methods you can use to identify these two species. The first is you can use internal uh, reproductive organ morphology, or you can use simple species-specific PCR primers to identify whether you have a zea or you have an armigera um, in your collection. So starting with the internal morphology, um, in the male reproductive organ of Armigera, you can see that there is one lobe on his reproductive organ. In Helicorpazia, there are, however, three lobes on his reproductive organ. When we looked at the internal, internal morphology of Zia and Armigera, you can see that these also had three lobes. So using internal reproductive organ morph morphology, your hybrids are going to look like they are always Zia. And so you can't tell if it's a hybrid or not. Um, the second method is using species specific PCR. Um, this methodology did also would not work for hybrids since you would either get a positive for Zia or a positive for Armigera, and you wouldn't be able to say, hey, I have a hybrid. I, I'm unsure. So the main goal of our project is to develop a new molecular method to identify Zia Armigera hybrids that someone may collect in the field here in Puerto Rico or anywhere else in the world. So after we have created all these F1 hybrids, what we did is um, we conducted some preliminary studies to construct a bioinformatics pipeline um, in order to identify hybrids. So the pipeline we use is called Admixture Analysis. And this is a bioinformatics program that can be used to um, identify and estimate the proportions of genomic diversity in an unknown sample. So, this program is also very common to use for human genetics projects. So you can use the same program to identify human ancestry. So um, we thought, hey, maybe we can do something similar that is good for estimate human um, genetic diversity ancestry and do the same thing for these invasive moths. So the first step in order to construct this admixture pipeline was first to create sequence eight different samples. Um, two of these were the F1 hybrids produced at Secchi's. Five were Helicorpazia, collected from four different states in the United States, Colorado, Illinois, uh, North Carolina, and Maine, and one Helicorpazia collected here in Puerto Rico, um, and then one Helicorpa Armigera, which was from Brazil. After these eight samples were sequenced, we used the genetic data and plugged into this admixture um, pipeline each of these samples in order to train um, this program uh, uh, to identify Zia or Midra hybrids. The way this works is based off of single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. Uh, and these are single base pair substitutions in a sequence of DNA that can be used to identify unique genotypes when um, morphology is unclear to identify what sample you may have. So down here on this graph, these all these little codes here are different SNPs or different unique single nucleotide polymorphisms that are unique to Zia armigera hybrids. Um, so using this admixture prediction, we were able first, to, when you plug in just pure Helicorpa Zia, it is predicted to be 100% Helicorpa Zia. When we plugged in a pure Helicorpa armigera, it was predicted to be 100% armigera. And then when we plugged in the sequencing data for it, one of the F1 hybrids produced at Sekis, it was 55% Armigera and 45% HCA, which is what this graph here on the right shows. Um, so all these SNPs here in red are those unique to Armigera, and those in blue are those unique to Zia. So using this pipeline, you can say, oh, these SNPs are found only in hybrids, or these SNPs are only in Armigera. If we have all these, we have a hybrid. Um, so the next step after we have designed this pipeline is we need to improve the precision and accuracy of this test by adding more sequencing diversity. Um, like I said earlier, this is just with eight samples. Uh, so it is representative of the Eastern United States and Puerto Rico and Brazil, but we have gaps in genetic diversity from, for example, Central America, South America, or the Western United States or Canada. Um, so what we're working on now is improving the sequencing diversity in order, in order to make this pipeline more accurate and representative of the genomic, genomic diversity of Zia and Armigera in the Americas. So this is the point where I joined in on this project in January of this year. 
Um, so like I said, we had to increase the genetic diversity of our test. Um, so what we did is I conducted over 100 extractions of whole DNA extractions using just simple blood and tissue key edging kits to extract DNA from Helix verbazia collected from distance, different states in the United States, those from Armidra and different uh, more actions for F1 and F2 hybrids. From, from these extractions, we selected 31 of the best quality samples to send for sequencing. Um, we were able to estimate quality using standard methodology, these being NanoDrop 2000 and Jella electrophoresis to make sure that the sequences we want, the uh, DNA samples we want to send to sequencing were of the highest quality that we could produce at Sekis. So you can see here, um, due to these bars here, that the uh, the genomic DNA was high molecular weight, which is one of the first metrics, metrics of quality control that we want to look at for sending samples to sequencing. And the second was just simple concentration of DNA and absorbance values um, uh, before we send to sequencing. So you can see here we had a high concentration of DNA. Before sending the sequencing, you generally want more than 10 nanograms per microliter. Um, and then a, a good absorbance is around 1.8 for a 260-280 ratio. So we also looked at that as well before sending these samples to sequencing. Next. Okay, so here we have a map of the diversity we've, we have added to the admixture pipeline so far. Um, so we did 31 genomes. One of them was a failure due to the concentration being too low. Um, unfortunately for that sample. And we added these to the eight genomes we previously sequenced. So what we sequenced um, was all these Eastern coast states and Colorado uh, in the US, an additional sample from Puerto Rico um, and those from Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, Maryland, Massachusetts, Maine, Kentucky, Tennessee, Illinois, and Louisiana. In the future, uh, we would like to cover more of the Southwest and Pacific Northwest. So right now I'm in touch with um, some colleagues at uh, Texas A&M University in Texas, colleagues in uh, University of Tucson in Arizona, and then colleagues in California to help make some more helicopter collections to improve our diversity in the future. So of these 30 samples, we did four Zia females, which were the parents of our F1 and F2 hybrids. Uh, and produced here at Sekis, four are major males, which were the fathers of our hybrids produced in the lab, and then four of our F1 Zia are major hybrids, and then 19 from these different states I just talked about. And these are what we just finished sequencing in October, just now. Um, and once we finish bioinformatic analysis and mapping, we're going to plug those into the pipeline. So just a little bit about the library preparation and sequencing. We did this through Rapid Genomics, uh, a company in Florida, which has provided very good results. And we have a good history with this, this sequencing lab. Um, they do a good job for a good price. Uh, they use the Illumina platform. And um, to break down library prep, we sent the whole genomic DNA um, from this step. The whole DNA is then fragmented and hybridized to the CaptureSeq probe, which then you um, is what you sequence after the uh, libraries prepared. So we got our sequence, our raw sequencing results, which are FASTQ files, um, just here, just now in October, um, which were 30 samples. And we have just started the bioinformatic assembly and analysis of the results. Um, for the first step of quality control for sequencing, what I did was put all our sequencing results through a program called FASTQC, um, which is just a, a free bioinformatics program. Um, that you can put FASTQ files through, and it will give you a good estimate of how your how quality, what kind of quality your results are. Uh, the first metric you look at is called FRED score. Um, so each base pair in a read is given a score, um, and this score gives you a, a general idea of whether you need to repeat the sequencing, repeat the extractions, um, or whether you can accept your results and move forward from there. So on average, our, the FRED score for our FASTQ files that we received from sequencing were around 30. Um, generally, the cutoff is about 25, less than 25. You probably need to repeat your experiments. The second metric we looked at was GC content. Um, for this particular sample, we had a GC content of 57%. Um, 
if your percentage is uh, has a much a greater difference than around 50% for GC, that could indicate you have contaminants or something went wrong during sequencing and you need to also repeat your experiments. So these look good. So we move forward to there, from there. The third metric we looked at was the read length. Um, this is just simply the length of the reads um, that were passed through the sequencer and gave us our sequencing data. Um, if they are less than around 150 base pairs, that can indicate that something broke and also that you need to repeat sequencing or extractions. Um, so since our read lengths were 151 base pairs, this is good. Our FASTQ files look good. We, we're going to proceed from here. So the next step once we is to continue with quality control and align and map our sequences and then plug them into our admixture pipeline. Once all of this is done, our main objective, like I mentioned before, is to produce this rapid identifi identification test for Zia Armidura hybrids. And what we're going to do is we're going to base this off of SNPs. So our goal is to make what it will probably be either PCR or microarray based uh, a test that someone can use in a lab um, to identify a hybrid. And this test will be based on SNP, single nucleotide polymorphisms, that we will be identifying um, from our hybrid samples. So right now I'm in contact with different biotech companies to help facilitate making this test. Um, Thermo Fisher and Illumina are two things we have looked at. Um, once we finish bioinformatics, we'll move more forward with that. And then once we have our SNPs panel test, we're going to validate that it works in our lab here with a, we have with all of the F1 and F2 hybrids that we bred here at Secchi's um, and make sure that the test works. Um, so yes. Uh, beyond test it, validating the test, we will also want to increase the, ge the genotype diversity for Zia and Armesra and hybrids. Um, right now I'm in contact with the other universities I mentioned in the US and also a contact in Mexico and South America is, um, we're looking to make contacts right now to share samples of Heliferpa. So that covers our main project in Secchi. So now I wanna talk a little bit about the other Noctuid um, projects that we run here at Secchi. Uh, these are population dynamics of Helicorpa and other Noctuids, insecticide resistance, resistance tests, namely BT resistance, um, uh, looking at metabolic rates of Helicorpa and other insects, and then also the use of machine learning for IDing test insects. <clears throat> okay, so first um, is population monitoring. And so in, in the Estacion Agricola in Juana Diaz, we have a sentinel block that we monitor bi-monthly um, for two main purposes. First is simply just to help collect samples. We have some traps that are always set up in the sentinel block, um, which has um, corn planted in it in this picture, picture that you can see. Um, so the first purpose is just to collect samples. And then the second purpose is to monitor how population levels change of three important pest species in Juana Diaz throughout the year. So the three species we look at are Spadoptera frugiperta, which you can see here, Helicoverpa zia, and then Chrysodexis includens. Um, so for, for Helicoverpa specifically, you can see that during the winter months, starting in around October, populations tend to drop. Um, and then in April and May, populations spike up for the rest of the summer. And there are quite a lot of moths in Juana Diaz during this time. So uh, in the lab, we have been saving over two years of samples from our Heliferpa population, partially due to PhD student Gustavo Rodriguez, uh, thanks to him. Um, and so we have these years and years of samples that we have saved for our own experimental purposes, but also to share with other labs around the world should they need samples from Puerto Rico of these three important pest species. Um, the third thing we want to do with these saved samples from the sentinel blocks is once we have the ZR major hybrid test constructed, we can go back and look at all these years of helicoverpa samples that we have saved. And if, we're, if, if it works well, um, we can backtrack and see what time, if and when, uh, ZR major hybrid may or may not have appeared in one of these. Uh, 
Another thing we do in SECIS is we maintain Lepidopter colonies um, for experimental purposes and also to share with other collaborators should they need samples um, for, collected from Puerto Rico. Um, we maintain three different colonies of Helicoverpa zia. Um, one collection is from Isabella, which was collected from corn. One collection is from Juana Diaz, also in corn. One is from Santa Isabel, which was from tomatoes and peppers. And the reason we keep these separate um, is for the purposes of uh, insecticide resistant studies. I would like to examine individually um, how these geographic regions um, may have different levels of insecticide resistance since there's such a, ge a geographical difference um, caused by the mountains in, for example, Isabella and Juan Adias. The second insect species we have in the lab is Chloridia varescens, uh, which we collected from Isabella in Gandules. And thirdly, we have Spodoptera frugiperda, which we found in Rio Piedras in corn. And we share these samples with other labs. So for example, um, I sent some Spodoptera frugiperda samples to Colorado, some of our collaborators, since they needed to monitor genetic diversity in Spodoptera here in Puerto Rico. So the third thing we look at is BT resistance. <clears throat> so the main goal of doing these experiments is are GMO crops effective in Puerto Rico for to help with pest control here? Um, a little background on what BT or Bacillus thuringiensis is the bacteria which this protein is isolated. BT crops are um, genetically modified plants that have an insecticidal protein isolated from this bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis, um, and these plants now produce this insecticidal protein, which can, if they work correctly, um, help a lot with pest control. So BT products um, are commonly corn, BT tomatoes, soybeans, peppers, or cotton. Um, for example, in North Carolina, BT cotton is very, very common. Um, and because it's so common, BT resistance is also very common in North Carolina. Um, BT crops have several advantages over traditional chemical sprayable insecticides um, in that they don't pollute groundwater or soil. Um, they also don't impact pollen, important pollinating insects like bees, um, since in order for them to work, the insect must eat the plant material. Um, so since bees don't, don't eat leaves, um, this insecticide doesn't have quite as much of an effect on pollinating insects. So right now we are assaying three different proteins CRY1AC, CRY1A.105, and CRY2AB. Um, these are three of the more common proteins found in the, uh, in the modern generations of BT crops. Um, so that's the reason why we're, we looked at these three. And the way these experiments work here is we have these bioacid trays, which are 16 well plates. Um, each tray has a different dose of insecticide. Um, and then you put a neonate larva uh, into each well and then monitor mortality over five days to a week. So we have our first results from these experiments uh, from the Santa Isabella collection. Um, and these are the, I I'll talk about the LC50s in just a moment. So we conducted over five days diet-based susceptibility bioassays. Um, so in those trays, you overlay um, artificial lepidopter diet with a different dose of insecticidal protein. Um, so after, at the end of the day for Santa Isabel, what we found was the, for CRY2AB2, the LC50, which is the concentration of insecticide that kills 50% of the population to be 128 micrograms per milliliter. For 1A.105, it was 0 0.2884 micrograms per milliliter. For 1AC, um, it was 0 0.03 micrograms per milliliter. So the reason that CRY2AB2 is so much higher than these other two is because each of these proteins has a slightly different mode of action. Um, and also the levels of expression of these proteins are different, uh, have different levels in each um, BT crop. So for example, um, in a BT cultivar, these toxins are pyramided, being that you might have, uh, you will have three or more different proteins in this, in this product to help with pest control but each don't have the same amount of protein being expressed in these tissues, or they might not be quite as toxic. Um, so in the future, what we need to do, we need to repeat these experiments and then add data from Juan Diaz and Isabella. Um, however, it is got 
kind of good news. At first glance, it looks like Hansenta Isabel uh, from this pre preliminary data, they're much less resist resistant than two BT proteins than in the southeastern US. Um, for my Zia colony, fr colony from 2016, the LC50 for CryO-NEC was 0 0.43 micrograms per milliliter. So my thinking on this is that BT crops are not quite as common in Puerto Rico as they are in North Carolina. And this, since there's not quite so much selective pressure coming from all these uh, modified crops being spread around, resistance here is much lower. Um, however, we need to, uh, I need to continue with these experiments from other collections. So the next thing we look at is uh, metabolic rates of insects and how they might be influenced by certain experimental conditions. We are using a Q-Box low range respirometer, which is this equipment here. Um, this equipment can be used to measure changes in oxygen use and carbon dioxide production from small insects or plants. Um, so the first thing we wanna do is we wanna produce data on respiration for the colonies we maintain at Sequis, these being the coffee berry borers, um, the parasitoids of coffee berry borers, the Heligroposia, the Chloridia virescens, and the Spodoptera frugiperta. We would also like to examine the effects of BT exposure on respiration for uh, Lepidoptera larva, the effects of parasitism from um, parasitic flies and Helicoverpa, and then parasitoid wasps in uh, coffee berry borers. And then lastly, we would like to look at temperature change effects on metabolism. Since climate change is ongoing and global temperatures are increasing, we would like to see how that affects respiration in insects as well. And this here graph shows you what a Helicoverpsia pupa oxygen consumption looks like over 300 minutes at room temperature. So as you can see, it steadily climbs. And the last thing I want to talk about is um, an experiment that we are go likely going to look at in the future. And this is something I did um, right before joining Sekis in January, and we wrote up the paper uh, this summer. Um, so this is this last bit is about the use of machine learning and microscope photography to identify insect pests in the field. Um, so comparing two species, Helicoverpsia and Helicoverpsia uh, virescens, these two species have eggs that look very, very similar to each other. Uh, they do have very slight morphological differences, um, which require a microscope to see. You can't see the differences with your naked eye. Um, so uh, in regards to Helicoverpsia, this species is very resistant to BT crops and to other insecticides, while virescens is much, much, much less resistant to insecticides. Um, however, in a growing field, if a grower sees insect eggs, oftentimes they may need to make the decision to apply insecticides in order to um, control the pest, right? Um, however, if you, for example, have BT crops and you have um, chloridia virescens eggs laid on your plant, the BT crops may handle the, um, the, the infestation of chloridia virescens without the need for applying insecticides. So if we can develop a means to rapidly and accurately identify insect eggs in the field, um, this may reduce the overall need for applying insecticides, which is great for the economics and the environmental impacts of pest control. <clears throat> so what we did is we took thousands of pictures of these two species of eggs and then trained a machine learning algorithm to identify these eggs. Um, and at the end of the day, we were able to um, by taking a microscope photograph of these eggs, the algorithm was able to 100% accurately identify an egg as either Zia or Varesens. Uh, in future, we may be moving forward to develop a smartphone application um, to also identify these two species of eggs in the field. And then in the future, we are gonna add new species of insects as well. And the way this relates to our other work, our hybrid work at Sekis is wood, a similar approach of microscope photography work for ZR major hybrids. Um, so while to the human eye, hybrid morphology looks very, very similar and the exact same um, as the parent species, when using photography and machine learning algorithms, um, oftentimes the algorithm is not looking at the same thing that you would expect for a human to look at. Um, so it could be that an algorithm is able to identify hybrids with a picture um, rather uh, much more easily where a human eye could not. And 
obviously if a picture could do this, this would be much more easier and cheaper than using genomic methods. Um, I'd like to acknowledge all past and present members of SECI's for all their hard work. Our UPR Rio Piedras volunteer undergraduates for all their hard work. Um, these are the permits that our work was conducted under and the co-op agreements and grants were from USDA APHIS. So thank you for listening. Does anyone have any questions?